Ah, ah, what is going on here? I'm just trying to enjoy Xenoblade Chronicles 3, one of the best games I've ever played, and the rest of the fandom is suffering. It's like a western anime Chernobyl, with toxic radiation polluting the whole friggin' world. Censorship has hit a new low, and it's hard to remain hopeful, but I'll try. Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Die here. So yeah, I apologize in advance, but this video is a bit of a downer. What started as a vid dunking on Square Enix has evolved into a tentacle monster of censorship and controversy. It really sucks, but a lot has been going on, and for a channel that fights for artistic freedom against rotten censors, I have to talk about it. There are a couple of incidents that all share a common thread, so indulge me as I guide you through these marshes. First, I want to talk about localization. I'll say it bluntly. A bad localization essentially is censorship. Instead of black bars, it's masking the original content with entirely different words, which can arguably be worse, like when China straight up redraws anime frames to cover characters up. This became relevant with the release of Live a Live, or as it's said in Japanese, Raibu a Raibu. As with other Square Enix works, a lot of liberties were taken with this game's localization, and fans were quick to point out the differences. The first screen cap I saw was this, where a guy tells a girl not to get angry, as it lets her pretty face go to waste. You'll see later that the writer was clearly trying to avoid referring to anything sexist. As such, this guy's official English text goes off on a completely irrelevant rant about pride and strength. This might not seem like the worst thing in the world, but you have to realize it's just one line out of hundreds and thousands in the game, and when you add them up, you might as well be playing a different game in the end, when none of the characters act like they did in Japanese. The blunder here is that casual players won't ever realize that, yes, perhaps this NPC was being sexist, but I'd argue that's a part of the experience. If he makes a condescending comment in Japanese, I want to see that in the English script. Changing it like they did is what gives localization a bad name, making fans want a more straightforward translation, because what we got isn't a translation at all. Instead, they took that translation, went, nah, and tossed it out for something original. Here's another example of the same blunder. In Japanese, this lawless guy says it's not a woman's place to butt in when a man is setting things straight. This mansplaining sort of attitude was changed in the Western release to be something about owning up to one's mistakes. The idea of setting things straight and making up for mistakes are indeed similar enough, but what gets lost in translation is this dude's condescending machismo. The woke crowd might be happy about that, because the Western version is fixing Japan's misogyny, but I'm not so delicate that I need someone to hide parts of a character's attitude from me. I don't need to live in a fantasy where everything is politically correct. Rather, I want what the Japanese got, regardless of the message or attitude it carries. Now, let it be said that this isn't a push to keep misogynistic stuff in my anime and games. It's a push to keep things accurate to the creator's vision, which does mean that if a Japanese artist wants to promote feminism or LGBT causes or oppose misogyny, I really don't mind so long as it's not trying to censor someone else's idea. Some fans jump the gun and accuse localizers of forcing in woke language into the AI Somnium Files games, but those themes were actually something the original creator wanted in the game, and they're present in both Japanese and English. Unfortunately, Square Enix has an ethics team of employees who sift through any of their actual artists' work to change things right as they begin to blossom. When Live a Live was originally released on the Super Nintendo, it had a scene where you could obtain the character Taiko's panties. For all modern Switch releases, this was changed to you finding her secret stash, to again be more politically correct and safe for work, I guess. I can assure you this was a choice from the ethics team, not the guys who made the game back in the 90s. As such, I'm sure the trash localization is actually encouraged by Square Enix, whereas with the Seven Seas Entertainment debacle, the original publishers actually sided with the fans. Since localizers often have a bad reputation of insulting people on Twitter for daring to criticize their work, I decided to look up the game's credits to find who was responsible for this game's English adaptation. 
The localization director was a man named John Crow, and while I wasn't able to find his public Twitter account, I did notice him being mentioned by a colleague named Liz Bushhouse, someone who's worked for Xseed and even Fantasy Star Online. Despite never even speaking with this woman, I discovered she had me blocked on Twitter, likely through a mass blocking tool. It really bugs me, because it definitely comes off as her covering her ears to any criticism of the industry, no matter who it's from and where it's directed. I know there are toxic trolls and jerks online who would stoop to threatening and harassing her, but I'm not one of those people, and her blocking me prematurely prevents any sort of meaningful conversation. All I started off wanting to do was ask John Crow why he localized live -a -Live the way he did. Thankfully, though, he's made his attitude clear with other projects he's worked on. Specifically, John is the localization lead for Final Fantasy XIV. Apparently, a lot of people like the localization for this game, but I still stand that he takes far too much creative liberty. His localization team has a philosophy that doesn't aim to replicate the Japanese, but rather to make text that feels like it was originally written in English. Wanting FF14 to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with other Western games, he didn't want his game to feel like a translation. To me, that just reads as, to appeal to a global market, that means you have to appeal to the casuals who wouldn't understand the nuances of Japanese. Regardless, there's an example of their philosophy put into practice that we can go over. They post it as an attempt to show how clever they are, improving upon the direct translation. But to me, it's just an admission of how they change things unnecessarily. Here, we have what they call the direct translation. I can swim, but Aliza, will you be okay? To which she responds, I'm glad you asked. Alphanod can't swim, but I'm good at swimming. That's right, Alphanod can't swim. This is the kind of example localizers often like to use when justifying their job, arguing that direct translations just don't sound natural. Personally, when I refer to translation though, I'm including the process of cleaning it up a bit. This first part actually reads perfectly fine to me. It's not until Eliza responds that it gets awkward, namely because this Alphanod guy is brought up without context. Here's the next step, where the localizer tweaks the direct translation. Now it's, I can swim, can you Eliza? With her replying, I'm glad you asked. I'm good at it actually, unlike Alphanod, who can't even swim. Unlike Alphanod, who can't even swim. This clears some things up, but butchers others. I hate what they did to the first sentence. For some reason, they killed any compassion the original line had. It was plenty obvious that when the woman asked, Eliza, will you be okay? She was referring to swimming. The way she asked gave a sense of genuine concern. With the tweaked translation, it just seems so blunt. I can swim, how about you? Of course, it's not the end of the world, but it's fascinating to see how things get omitted. I like how they clear up the second bit, though. Rather than starting the sentence with Alphanod, it gives him proper context. It's much clearer for her to state her own skill in swimming before comparing herself to someone else. The problem now is that it sounds redundant when she mentions Alphanod a second time. It almost sounds like Rena in Higurashi when she repeats herself as a speech quirk, but I don't think that's what's intended here. Lastly, we're given the pre-edit text, which is the step where the localizer takes control to interpret for us. I can swim well enough, can you, Eliza? Well, it just so happens I am a skilled swimmer, unlike my dog-paddling brother. Hmm, sure, this definitely flows in English, but it does so by omitting details and adding others. Again, the first woman's question seems rather blunt. It seems odd to add that part about her swimming well enough while getting rid of the part, will you be okay, that I appreciated in the first step. I do like how this pre-edit fixes the redundancy, and it does help to know that Alphanod is her brother, but I hate the inclusion of dog paddling, as that specific term isn't anywhere in the Japanese, and it also removes her thanking the woman for asking. If I had it my way with this specific line, I would have gone with, I can swim, but Eliza, will you be okay? And then, thanks for asking, I'm actually a good swimmer, unlike my brother. That's right, it turns out that Alphanod can't swim. With good voice actresses, this exchange would sound totally natural, while retaining all the information contained in the original. Even better, it doesn't have to introduce the concept of dog paddling. Sadly, people who simp for aggressive localization tend to write off anything accurate as dry and unnatural, validating and praising the localizers for these changes. 
I especially hate how this person specifies giving English speakers the same experience, because I'd argue that her attitude with dog paddling creates a strong difference between the two versions. In the Western version, Eliza comes off as having more attitude, whereas the Japanese Eliza seems more pleasant. Honestly, if all localizations were this tame, I wouldn't have an issue with how this industry is going. But oftentimes, this attempt to sound natural is mainly an excuse to make things more edgy or hip, only to come off looking like that one, how do you do, fellow kids, meme. For instance, we've got this bit from the Yakuza games. It's hard to read, but the localized version says, just thinking about those awful men makes me cringe. I'm literally shaking right now. The actual translation doesn't have this Gen Z language, instead simply saying, just remembering gives me the shivers. It makes the localized version feel like an abridged series. Another bizarre attempt to flavor text has Estelle from The Legend of Heroes saying, yeah, everyone says that before they get hit with the big stick, instead of, oh, you've done it now, I'll make you regret those words. Seriously, there are dozens of ways the original translation could be worded without changing things to getting hit with a big stick. The original was perfectly fine as is. The World Ends With You, specifically its sequel, is filled with this edgy dialogue that tries to sound more hip at the expense of the original meaning. Here, we've got a chick who resorts to spamming slang at every chance. Instead of saying UG, which stands for underground, she says OMG. Then when she elaborates on the underground, it's changed to, you nerds seriously thought you were still in Shibuya? This is the UG, dummies. There's some extra attitude in the last panel. Ugh, I literally spelled it out for you. UG, the underground, you're in the afterlife, losers. If you were to listen to an entire game with this injected attitude at every turn, your perception of this character will wind up completely different. Little changes like this are everywhere. What should say, you seem to be in trouble, was changed to, why the long faces, chums, sad emoji. Chums? What sort of odd artistic inspiration gave the localizer the idea to write chums? This isn't supposed to be their canvas. If it's not in the Japanese, you don't need to put it in here in English. That's right, she's our leader, was changed to, that's right, she's our queen. Is this guy supposed to be gay or something? I've actually seen this in other localizations, where you've got a guy who speaks with a feminine voice, like Liron and Gurren Lagann. Instead of just replicating that vocal tonality like Steve Bloom did, sometimes localizers will sparkle up the dialogue, making it seem like a bad gay stereotype. I recently played the visual novel Hatsumira on Steam and really enjoyed it thanks to them putting up an 18 plus patch to get around Steam censorship. Its localization, though, was all over the place, especially with this gay guy named Karin. Literally everything he says has gay slang like girl and queen bitch, when that is not what he says in the Japanese voiceover. It's as if his voice and appearance didn't seem gay enough for themselves. They just had to pile it on with dialogue, too, which is sad because he's a pretty interesting character outside of the altered text. Here, we've got a pathetic attempt to inject memes into the script, the guy's supposed to be talking about the scan ability in the game, but the localizer changed it to taking my galaxy brain for a test run. It might seem like just silly memes, but a lot of these attempts to flavor dialogue come right from Twitter, such as a guy wondering about his Japanese curry being authentic, getting changed into a matter of cultural appropriation. Now, it would be arrogant to assume that a game or anime's success hinges upon its localization, but I can't help but feel these strange changes in both the localization team and with Square's ethics department have ultimately cost The World Ends With You sales because fans are sick of this stuff. We're also sick of the pandering. One of the things constantly being changed for the West is femininity. Just like with Seven Seas and I Think I Turned My Childhood Friend Into a Girl, we often see Japan's view on femininity co-opted by Western writers who think they know better or object to the original sentiment. Aegis Rim is guilty for making a femboy non-binary, and here the localizers are trying to avoid referring to a woman's breasts. They're skirting around the actual text, like how I have to censor myself on YouTube, which absolutely sucks. Here, we have a guy remarking about how crazy it is for a girl to go out on her own, implying it's dangerous. The Western version just ignores the part about being a girl. Same for this one. It's got Ellie declaring her party is strong despite consisting of women. 
Any reference to them being women, though, is taken out of the localization. Mind you, this statement doesn't even mean that women are weak. Rather, it's just acknowledging that there are people out there who would in fact underestimate a team of women. Both serve as empowering moments for the female party, but the Western release ignores the fact that sexism is a part of the story. It's especially pathetic here, because the dialogue is supposed to be Sydney saying, assuming one of us was going to get hurt, it better be the dude than the girl, right? He's trying to be chivalrous, putting himself in harm's way to protect a girl. The localizers wanted none of that, instead changing the line to a pompous, if anything, I'd say most of the girls I know are better at fighting monsters than I am. The problem with a lot of feminist media these days is that it assumes a woman can't be strong or competent unless she's absolutely obliterating her male colleagues. As a result, we've got guys being humiliated in order to make the women seem superior, rather than having both sexes working in tandem, like, you know, the majority of anime and JRPGs. It's really sad to see a character's chivalry transformed into inferiority, because I want to experience the characters as Falcom intended for the Japanese. Following similar progressive logic, these same localizers wouldn't dare stand for a character labeled as Chubby Lady, instead making her into a dramatic noble. There is no doubt in my mind that someone affiliated with or in support of body positivity intercepted this line between the Japanese writers and the final Western product, deciding they had to step in and fix an injustice. That or maybe they were afraid Sony would take issue with it, but that's a whole other issue that we'll get to soon. Oh yeah, and the same thing here. We've got this guy, Suduga, asking whether someone is a man or a woman, with the Western version changing it to asking for the person's pronouns. Unless the Japanese word for pronoun is in that original text box, which it isn't, then I don't want it in the Western release. That right there really is the Gen Z equivalent of the old rice ball jelly donut thing. It's not hard at all to understand that fans want accuracy. The only thing stopping most anime fans from buying what they want is a language barrier. It's not a matter of cultural sensitivities or political differences. We just want to know what the hell they said in Japanese. And it's a lot easier for localizers to just provide that than it is for us to individually all learn Japanese for ourselves. Heck, when it's something that can be easily translated, we often don't even need official localization. That's perhaps the most justifiable reason that piracy is still thriving within anime. Even if you have the money and desire to support the industry, the fan-subbed version is often more authentic anyway, meaning that you'd be paying money for a worse experience. That's what makes censorship so insulting, and the most insulting case of censorship has just hit us recently with Square Enix's new Manga Up app. Almost immediately after launching, fans noticed that the manga on their platform was heavily censored, with black bars covering up literally anything that could be considered sexual, whether it was or not. It didn't even matter if the girl was wearing a bra or a bikini top, the entire chest would be covered up obnoxiously. Echi and anime go hand in hand, so a lot of your typical manga fare winds up looking like a drunk chessboard with all the censor bars. This one from Marin Kitagawa from Dress Up Darling is especially pathetic, because she's not naked, and you can buy this manga physically without the censorship. I recently made a video about censoring innocuous things like school uniforms, and how that winds up branding basic aspects of femininity inherently sexual. Because we can be attracted to pretty much anything, the more you try to avoid showing something indecent, the more you just wind up oppressing people unfairly. That's the signal that gets sent with censorship like this. A fully clothed woman having a big black bar over her pants because, what, they crease? It's like some sleazy manager at an office telling his receptionist that she needs to cover up her cleavage because it distracts him. Now, Manga Up has since responded to the censorship, justifying this crap by saying it was unavoidable in order to secure a worldwide release. This means they're blaming the various platforms, such as the Apple Store, or payment services that may object to the manga on their app. What they also hint at is how there are certain countries demanding more censorship than others, and Square's solution was just to give everyone the fully censored versions, instead of trying to offer different versions to different regions. In either case, it just shows that they don't really care about manga or its fans, and are instead just trying to capitalize on it shamelessly. 
If it were a matter of the platform, and you really cared about being the best manga app out there, you'd make your own platform, even if it meant not being promoted on more censor-heavy services. If it's due to international differences, then only censor things in the countries that demand it. Both of these things would cost money, which Square wouldn't dare do. In fact, a lot of fans believe this outrageous censorship exists because Square couldn't be bothered to place the censor bars on their own. Instead, they have an AI that searches for what it thinks are crotches and chests, placing the black bars automatically. That would certainly explain why something as innocuous as a kneecap was censored. Now, I didn't see proof of this, but I even heard that the letter Y was censored in a certain font for looking too much like the shape of cleavage. All of this shows a complete lack of respect for potential buyers, and if that's the attempt they're going to make to entice us, they can just straight up fail. It's a terrible business model anyway, charging you not on a subscription basis, but individually per chapter. While they offer some chapters for free, they split their catalog into sub-chapters to make what seems like a lot of free manga actually barely any. That, and for the chapters you do buy, that shit's time-gated and will expire. I personally advocate that nobody, absolutely nobody, should be signing up for this service. They don't deserve your money, and supporting them will only encourage further censorship down the road. If there's any hope on the horizon, it would be that fans are working on AI algorithms of their own to actually uncensor anime and manga. Two programs, called Hent AI and Deep Cream PY, attempt to restore content placed behind mosaics and censor bars. It's not perfect by any means, as it often struggles to differentiate between black bars and other dark lines on the page. But the effort is admirable. It just blows my mind how dense some of these localizers get. We anime fans buy up whatever looks interesting, and most of the time our only concern is whether it's censored or not. It can be infuriating to convey this sentiment to companies, and one of the causes of this comes from the people working at those companies straight up hating the fans. When they're not hiding behind a wall of generic PR language, they're out there getting pissed at their own target audience. Recently, the manga for Summertime Rendering was licensed by Udon Entertainment. The manga features a character named Mio Kofune, who is apparently 15 years old, with some occasional nips on display. Udon went ahead and censored out these details for their Western release, defending their case by claiming the changes were minor and were made to avoid having the book criminalized as CP. On paper, that does sound like a reasonable defense, given that the United States has a federal law called the PROTECT Act, which deems even fictional representations of minors in obscene situations illegal. Since Mio is labeled as 15, she counts in the U.S. as a minor, and showing her naked body could be seen as obscene in court. The odds of this actually happening are extremely unlikely, though. In 2013, a man was arrested for possessing hentai, but only in conjunction with actual photos of children. His predatory nature came first. Lawmakers have opposed this PROTECT Act in the name of free speech, and California doesn't even abide by it, refusing to criminalize works as long as they don't involve or depict real children in their creation and consumption. Despite these laws in place, no anime publisher has ever been criminalized for this, and if they were, pretty much everyone would be guilty. You could make a case for obscenity with literally any ecchi anime that takes place in high school, and there have been tons of those throughout localization history. Also, Udon's forgetting that the easiest solution would be to either say that Mio is 16 or older, or just omit her age entirely. That's what Senran Kagura did, till Sony reared its ugly head. That's what makes this incident with Udon so strange. To anyone versed in anime, Mio's little bath scene is an everyday occurrence, so why all of the sudden does it need to be censored? The representative from Udon appears to be understanding of this controversy on social media, but their rationale still comes off as overly defensive. They claim that because the original author signed off on the changes, that they weren't disrespecting the art. I disagree. Just because a creator signs off on censorship, that doesn't mean it was what they originally envisioned or wanted. Some artists are more apt to defend their works than others, and when it comes to localization, which is often a secondary market to them, creators might just be choosing the path of least resistance. It would be a different story if these creators were suddenly asked to censor their own works domestically. 
That's the kind of pressure that has Ken Akamatsu, the creator of Love Hina, taking office in Japanese government to fight against censorship culture. The other thing that Udon brings up is that the summertime rendering anime also lacks Mio's nips, employing the same steamy bath sensor in Barbie doll anatomy. In that case, though, such changes were made to appeal to Japanese broadcasting standards. They were probably aiming for a specific time slot, and being forced to air on a different network or later at night might have cost them revenue. Plus, it's always possible that such details can be added back in with the Blu-ray release. The fact of the matter is that Mio in the Japanese manga isn't a problem, and fans want to push Western developers to defend that notion, at least if they want our money. This alone would have probably brushed away, if not for further provocation on part of the localization community. Jordan Reynolds is an editor who worked with Summertime Rendering when it featured on Manga Plus. He doesn't work directly for Udon, but he does seem to be advocating on their behalf, belittling fans for caring about the censorship. He went on a long tirade on Reddit that has since been deleted, but I want to counter what he says. First off, his language is confrontational and condescending, framing it like fans find Mio's nethers more important than the rest of the story. Now, if this Udon version were the only one in existence, then I'd understand putting up with a tiny bit of censorship in order to enjoy the full manga. However, we fans have access to uncensored versions, giving us no incentive to support a product that can't be seen as definitive. Again, the author signing off on it doesn't matter, because he's doing it for money and not principle. Jordan claims that by caring about this instance of censorship, people are only enforcing the stereotype that anime fans are all creepy, fat neckbeards who love their 2,500-year-old lolis. That's a load of crap, because there are plenty of different people that don't qualify as incel neckbeards that still oppose this censorship. At that point, the stereotyping is an issue for those who wish to ignore reality. Jordan's rant sparked further discussion, and eventually, someone brought up the idea that censorship is wrong as a matter of principle. He shot this sentiment down by saying that nobody was complaining about the other ways the manga was censored. In this case, he must be referring to how the anime made other changes from the manga. All I've got to say is that we're not thrilled that the summertime rendering anime is a bit tamer than the comic, but at least in their case, that stuff was being done within Japan and not as a result of foreign influence. We'd be just as pissed if whoever distributes the anime in the West made further changes from its Japanese version. Of course, it's silly to demand that fans prove they hate censorship in general, to prove they aren't always just in it for the lewd kiddos. It's just that this type of content is usually on the front lines. I'm always complaining about censorship of all sorts of things, such as the stupid Crunchyroll version of World's End Harem, which did feature adults in a lot of its scenes. Either way, we'll still have people stereotyping anime fans as creepers, and it sucks when it comes from within the community. That takes us to our next topic, the controversy surrounding anime Matsuri. There's this YouTuber named Ministry of Otaku who attended the con and confronted a Tifa cosplayer. She was carrying a sign equating lolicons to child lovers, and he told her she was asking for a fight by provoking people like that. Of course, Twitter took this as him threatening to pick a fight with her directly, but even though he chose his words very poorly, it seems like he was indicating that it would make someone else want to start a fight with her, not necessarily him. Either way, he handled that situation unprofessionally, and I have no intent to defend him for that. I will say, though, that with the way the girl was presenting herself at this con, she was putting herself in a situation where any potential critics would all look like bad guys. Even genuine attempts to debate her would be interpreted as harassment. The thing that bothers me is that anime conventions are supposed to be fun and centered around a love for the art. They're usually places where all sorts of fans can gather under a common interest. Naturally, this means that a convention will have both fans of Loli and critics of it. Thus, bringing a sign that criminalizes a portion of the community is intentionally provocative and not at all in the spirit of having a good time. In other words, it's a douchey thing to do. I likened it to bringing a homophobic sign to a Pride event. And, well, that went over as well as you'd expect. Twitter is not the place for people to have civil discussions, and yet that's where all the drama tends to be, and where companies are all typically measuring the masses. Now, for the record, I am not attracted to lolis, but I do defend their right to exist 
based on how easy it is to start labeling all attractive anime characters as minors and lollies. For instance, Mio in Summertime Rendering that we were talking about before, she's 15, but she's not a lolly. And if you didn't have her labeled as 15 within the story, it's possible you might not ever know she wasn't your normal adult. It's a dangerous, slippery slope, and once we start criminalizing lolis, the woke will only add more crosshairs, expanding the net of what can be censored next. I have actual proof of this later in the video. For now, I'll leave it at this. If you really thought lolicons were predators, you'd probably do more than carry around a sign to insult them. The proper response to a child lover is to call the cops and get them investigated as a genuine threat to kids. Mind you, kids attend conventions like this, after all. So if you really felt those kids were in danger, you would do more. Since people don't take this kind of action, and are using the term in a broader sense, them labeling people as pedos just wears the word down till it doesn't mean anything, which is another reason we don't see lolly stuff in court very often. Hunting for lolicons isn't an efficient way to weed out the actual threat. Authorities are much better off focusing on trafficking rings and fishing sites. Stuff like that. Our last topic for today happens to be the anime retailer Right Stuff, which has long since been one of the most reliable places to purchase anime-related goods from. Just recently, though, they've been bought out by Crunchyroll, which, as you should know, is now merged with Funimation under ownership of Sony. For a while now, Sony has shifted its CEO and headquarters from Japan to California, employing woke policies that censor not just anime in the West, but also developers working from Japan. Sony and Funimation were the ones to blame when Ishizoku Reviewers was licensed and then neglected for not adhering to the company's values. Clearly, those values have reared their head again, because while Right Stuff assures us that they'll still carry a wide variety of products, they will no longer be selling erotica. Sure enough, if you search for products they used to sell, such as the Hentai Heaven Collection Blu-rays, you'll either find no listings or be directed to an error page. Mind you, collections like these are typically the only way fans can get their hands on uncensored H anime in an official, legal capacity. I only bring it up because those erotica products Right Stuff sold were meant for and made by adults. It just goes to show that if we let these companies do as they please, the scope of what we'll see censored will only expand. If you listen to their excuses, they always go, It's okay. We only censored this little thing over here. It's not like we're taking any of this other stuff away from you. That's what Nintendo localizers said about their censorship during the Wii U era. They were like, If you want to find lewd content, you can always just go over to Senron Kagura and games like that. We're not taking those away from you. Well, guess what's not around anymore? Thus, if we can't defend anime where it currently stands, then the playing field will grow so small that all that remains is a giant goalpost. It also doesn't help that Crunchyroll owning right stuff serves as a conflict of interest. There's no evidence of it yet, but I could totally see them giving Sentai Filmworks a harder time selling Blu-rays on the site. All of this is honestly really depressing, but there are things we can do. The obvious one is to not support companies when they pull this crap. Let them know that if they want our money, they have to earn it by providing quality content. It doesn't just end there, though, because if we don't let our voices be heard, those companies will start feeling validated in their decisions, and they'll start changing anime at its source. Our protest has to come in two waves. First, you gotta tell them you ain't buying their stuff, and second, you gotta tell them exactly why you won't support it. There's a third step as well, and that's to seek out platforms, creators, and companies that actually do the right thing. We need to promote and support them so that they can become more successful than the current market. This almost makes me sound like some kind of rebel or revolutionist, which I know seems silly for fictional entertainment. But at the end of the day, what we're asking for is extremely basic and entirely reasonable. We just want companies to translate Japanese works faithfully, with the same content and context present in the original. That, and we want Japanese creators to make what they want, without being pressured or coerced by Western standards. If you agree with me, go ahead and share this video around. Leave your comments. And if you please, feel free to debate me on these issues. Thanks for watching! 
If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom. I want to give a special shout out to all my $10 and up supporters. Video Gamer 75, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai 1983, Freebrick, Cosmonaut, RNG or Shuffles 1498, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Johnny Tsunami, Link Pendrago, Brandon Baker, Caitlin P, Vladimir Rovna, Succubus Sakura, Normace, Jonathan Padua, and SF Giants fan Mike. Thank you all so much.